Thursday night, a new interview with Russian President Vladimir Putin um, with a former Fox News host was posted online. Um, you might have read that it started with Putin giving a long, inexplicable and boring history lecture that went on and on and on and on and didn't seem to have a point and that definitely lost most of its American audience. True, all true. Except for the part of the history lecture where Putin got to 1939, at which point he then claimed in this interview that it was Poland who started World War II. Poland did it, because even though Poland had cooperated with Hitler up to a point, they stopped cooperating with Hitler when Hitler really wanted them to cooperate more. And once that happened, Hitler had no choice. He just had to invade. And by the way, it was kind of doing Poland a favor. Exact same line. I mean, we haven't had someone trying to sell this line to an American audience since it happened the first time in 1939, right, with, with Philip Johnson's quote-unquote reporting Right? When, we, when, when with him, we had a committed American fascist allied with the Nazis, openly rooting for them, trying to sell us this bill of goods. That happened in 1939. It hasn't happened since until now. And the reason Putin is trying to sell us, the American public, this bizarre line now is more worrying than it is interesting. It might be boring, but it is worrying. Here's Russian journalist Masha Gessen explaining it for an American audience in The New Yorker, in a piece that I really highly recommend that you take a look at, if you can, in The New Yorker. Gesson says this, quote, I can't get one passage out of my mind. In the history lecture portion of the interview, when Putin got to 1939, he said, Poland cooperated with Germany, but then it refused to comply with Hitler's demands. Poles forced him. They overplayed their hand, and they forced Hitler to start the Second World War by attacking Poland. The idea, Geshen says, that the, the idea that the, the, the victim of the attack serves as its instigator by forcing the hand of the aggressor, that is central to all of Putin's explanations for Russia's war in Ukraine. Geshen says, though, to my knowledge, this is the first time Putin described Hitler's aggression in these same terms. Quote, the way Putin described the beginning of the Second World War in this interview suggests that in his mind, he might see himself as Hitler, but perhaps a wilier one one who can make inroads into the United States and create an alliance with its presumed future president. It's telling, too, Gessen continues, that Putin took the time to accuse Poland of both allying with Nazi Germany and inciting Hitler's aggression. As he has done with Ukraine in the past, he's positioning Poland as the heir to Nazism. Putin mentioned Poland more than 30 times in this conversation with Mr. Carlson. If I were Poland... I'd be scared, end quote. Vladimir Putin is selling a new line to Americans. He's saying that Poland is the real aggressor that we should blame for World War II. And he's starting to use the same language, starting to cite the same weird reasons he used to justify invading Ukraine when he talks about Poland. And what's really, really important to understand about that is that Poland is a NATO country. They have been for 25 years now. And we're a NATO country, too. And if Putin decides that he doesn't just want to invade Ukraine, which he's done twice now since 2014, and he doesn't just want to inv invade Georgia and Moldova as well, which he has also invaded, if he decides, as he is sort of threatening here, if he decides that he's going to start shooting at Poland now, too, or trying to take land in Poland, that would be Putin and Russia attacking NATO which would oblige the other 30 NATO countries in the world, including us, to come to their rescue against Russia. Or maybe not. Less than 48 hours after that interview posted online, former President Donald Trump, at a rally, said if he's president again, basically, he would not honor that commitment. He appears to have made up a conversation with what he called the leader of a, quote, large NATO country, in which he says he told this leader that if that country were attacked by Russia, quote, no, I would not protect you. He said, quote, in fact, I would encourage them, meaning Russia, to do whatever the hell they want. As David Sanger wrote in The New York Times today, quote, the larger implication of his statement is that he, Trump, might invite President Vladimir Putin of Russia to pick off a NATO nation as a warning and a lesson to the 30 or so others in NATO about heeding Mr. Trump's demands. 
I have to stress here um, that Trump really did use the word encourage. He did not say that the United States would sit idly by in case Russia invaded a NATO ally. He said he would encourage Russia to go after one of our allies. He would encourage them. In other words, he would tell Russia to go take out one of our allies with the assurance that we do nothing to help. And this is happening within 48 hours of Putin telling a handpicked interviewer which countries he thinks really have had it coming. And he's got one of them in NATO at the top of his list. But don't forget, President Biden is three years older than that guy, so obviously there's equally enormous risk in picking either of these candidates to be president of the United States. One is obviously old, one is also old, and facing 91 felony charges, and saying he will literally encourage Russia to expand its war to hit our allies, while Russia's dictator is signaling to an American audience that he plans to do just that. Lots of other countries, I'm sad to say it, but lots of other countries have to deal with former presidents and prime ministers facing criminal charges. It is awful and complicated and fraught, and nobody in this country wishes that we had to deal with that, but now we do. That said, take comfort in the fact that lots of other countries have had to deal with that one way or another. Maybe we can learn something from the lessons of how they've done it well or poorly. Lots of other countries have had to deal with criminal charges against leaders and would-be return leaders. But nobody is dealing with a would-be return president telling a dictator who's just invaded one of our allies to please go on and invade another. Pick one. Go on. Do it. For that one, that's us alone. Joining us now is former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. Ambassador McFaul was recently in Lithuania, where he had the opportunity to speak with some of that country's leaders. Uh, it has a little bit of insight uh, into how this may be playing in our allies, who are very much uh, at, the, uh, at the pointy end of the spear here in, in discussions like this. Uh, Ambassador McFaul, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Let me first ask you um, if you feel like any of the reaction to what President Trump said this weekend, the interpretation of uh, what it means, its implications, if you feel like any of it's being misconstrued, or you feel like people are getting it the wrong way around, or do you feel like this is getting the right kind of response? I'm shocked by how muted the response is. Hmm. Just You've said it several times tonight, Rachel. It is just completely shocking what he said. Um, uh, and the fact that we're not all, thank you, by the way, for devoting so much time in your program tonight on it, and thank you for making the connections to the 1930s, because this is a 1930s vibe. And when I was in Lithuania meeting with leaders, not just from Lithuania, but Poland, Latvia, Estonia, that's the metaphor they're using and talking about these terms. What's shocking to me is that we're all not shocked by it. We've become so mm. used to Mr. Trump saying these outrageous things, and then it's just, oh, he's that's just Trump being Trump. But the fact that he said Russia, Putin, should invade one of our allies and he would encourage it, it's just outrageous, extraordinary. Uh, so that's the reaction that I think is strange to me, that there's not more people saying that, especially national security officials, former officials in the Republican Party, because I know that they agree with me and I'm shocked that they're so silent tonight. In, in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, in Poland, in those countries, is there a sense that this is more than just uncouth, that this is something that, that there's a real threat here, that Putin is actually sort of testing whether or not he can cross yet another border, that he can start military action against yet another country? Without question. Uh, publicly, leaders from those countries have said it. Behind closed doors, they see, say it with even more uh, emotion in their voice. And here's the scenario they worry about. Right now, Russia is stuck fighting a, a difficult, you know, stalemated war in Ukraine. Thank goodness that they haven't achieved greater objectives, and we need to help them, so that the Ukrainians, so that they don't. But they worry what happens two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, when Russia has greater capability, and we, because Mr. Trump comes to power, are no longer interested in defending our, our NATO allies. And they talk very openly 
about what will we have to do if the United States is not there to help us. They talk very openly about how the Soviet Union was weak in 1941 when Hitler invaded, but came back roaring in 1943, 44, 45. And they talk very explicitly about will the United States recognize the Article 5 commitment that we have in NATO to defend them, and if we don't, which coalition of countries will have to do it on their own? Now, I hope they're wrong, and I think it's important to understand and underscore that so far, Russia and the Soviet Union has never attacked a NATO country. That's the good news. But the fact that they're having these conversations is deeply troubling, exacerbated then by what Mr. Trump just said a few, a few days ago. And it, I mean, some of the response has been sort of leavened on the Republican side. And I'm thinking in, in, uh, principally here about um, Senator Marco Rubio, but also some other Republicans who have said, hey, listen, you know, we passed a law that says the Senate has to give permission if a president ever wants to get us out of NATO in the, pa in, in the future. Um, you know, this is, like you said, Trump just being Trump. This isn't, this isn't a real risk. I feel like that may be true on paper, but the risk is that the green light is given once an American commitment is questioned on American soil by a would-be American leader, that legally it doesn't necessarily matter, that the green light has been given, that the signal has been given, that the security uh, umbrella has been removed, regardless of legalistically whatever happens as a consequence of Trump's remarks. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That's exactly right, Rachel, which is to say, yeah, the law is there. We're not going to withdraw from NATO. But if a NATO country is attacked, especially if it's an ambiguous attack, right, not tanks rolling to Tallinn, but something strange, and then Trump says, I don't care because they didn't pay us, that's when NATO begins to crumble with or without that law in place.